Ecofeminism, then, is about people and planet, and more specifically about women and planet. And so this is an, an image of what we, we, ecofeminists love doing is dancing around trees. So it's, uh, it's one of the, of the uh, things that you perhaps most associate. If any of you are familiar with ecofeminism, you probably think of dancing around trees. <laughs> dancing around trees. Um, so what's ecofeminism all about? Well, ecofeminism links ecology and feminism, as it, as it sounds. And it emerged really in, uh, at the same time as the feminist movement, the, uh, what's usually called a second wave feminism, and, uh, and the green movement, all around the early, early 1970s. So it came into being, uh, they all came into being together. Um, and uh, the, um, the ecofeminists have been associated with a lot of campaigns. A lot of it grew out of the peace movement, and people uh, became ecofeminist out of the peace movement. Uh, in this country, particularly, th uh, things like the Green and Common campaign. There was a lot of links there. But uh, in other parts of the world, the most famous Kenyan Greenbelt movement, the replanting of trees, which was led by um, Angari Matai, the, uh, the, the, who's died, died recently, um, but uh, led that valiantly. Uh, whole campaigns about women and environment and development, about fault, uh, maldevelopment, uh, the, the taking off bringing countries into the, uh, into the modern industrial era was seen to be the, the wrong way to go. A lot of campaigns about forests, a lot of campaigns about health, a lot of campaigns about toxic waste, um, a, a, a host of, of grassroots campaigns that women got involved in. Um, a particular focus of ecofeminism is the environmental impact on women. And uh, women have, be have, have been... Uh, strongly represented in uh, green movements, in local green movements. But unfortunately, as recent studies have shown, not in the leadership. So they're often in the grassroots, in, a very, in women's usual position, doing a lot of the work, but not actually taking the leadership roles, mainly because they haven't got wives. Uh, so I've just been uh, uh, examining a PhD that studied um, uh, w w women in leadership roles in, in the green movement and found that... Uh, that as it got to the uh, more senior positions, it was round the clock working, and anybody who had responsibilities for caring couldn't do round the, you know, drop everything at the drop of a hat and fly off somewhere. So the only people who could do that were men who had women to look after their children. So, um, so uh, or, or, or single women, or women with no children. Uh, the, I mean, obviously they could take the roles, but. Uh, so that's at the heart of really what feminism's about, as much as anything else, is that women find it very difficult to take part fully in, uh, in economic and political life because of the, their responsibility for caring and for that kind of work. So again, the... Come on. That's what I've just been saying, so I'll skip that one. So uh, the image uh, that uh, you associated with women then, and particularly early ecofeminism, and, uh, and uh, perhaps straight through to today, is the, uh, is the image of woman as the nurturer, woman as the carer, the nurturer. This kind of, what I call this kind of fuzzy, uh, fluffy image of women. Um, women as mothers and nurturers. And the idea was, in the early stages, that women had a special understanding of nature because nature was a nurturer too. Nature was a carer. And women and nature had solidarity in that in they were both nurturers, both carers. Um, but th this caused some problem for feminism generally because it made it look as if it was um, romanticising women's domestic roles. So there's a lot of argument within women's movements about whether ecofeminism was often critiqued for being essentialist, saying women are essentially good people, better people, nour nour nourishing, caring people. They're just generally really nice. <laughs> and therefore, on the other token, men are really bad. <laughs> um, and, uh, and a lot of the early movement got very um, uh, concerned about uh, images of women in, in, in a more spiritual sense, and certainly the idea of woman as a goddess and, uh, and uh, in, in tune with the moon, whereas men were the sun gods, uh, we, women were women of the moon, and there was a lot of 
quite romantic stuff about that. But a, a lot of it was also traced back to these uh, images of women, the, uh, the early figurines, which uh, some of these go... I think this is a reproduced one, this is only a made-up one, but these images, um, fertility images, that go back many, many thousands of years. And this was seen as being uh, the origin of women's power in society, when women were recognised as being highly socially valued because of their, um, their nurturing. So it didn't matter if you had a few layers around your middle. <laughs> it wasn't seen as a problem. In fact, it was seen as being very attractive to have very, very big, <laughs> very, very big hips. Um, now, the reason that um, the, this, these images were quite important in ecofeminism was because the early stages of ecofeminism in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s were led mainly by poets and, th and, and theologians. So people who were interested in, in uh, uh, poetic images and spiritual images. And um, it was linked to concepts like the goddess and to concepts like earth-based consciousness. So rather than spirituality built on the idea of what they call sky gods, gods somewhere in the firmament up there, I'm saying this in the church as well, aren't I? Um, so they were mu much more concerned with uh, spirituality, which obviously is, mu uh, is something that Greens would very much favour, spirituality being much more earth-based, a re reverence for nature, a spirituality in nature. So they were very keen on that. Um, they also thought that because of the things like these figurines, these, these figurines here, that, um, that women po probably had more power in early, early societies, um, in prehistoric societies, that women were more powerful because they had the mystery of birth. They had the mystery of life. Um, uh, and uh, so that there's often claims that uh, women originally had power which was taken from them. Um, now, I, I have done research on the anthropology of early, early uh, human society and, to be honest, I can't find any evidence, apart from these figurines, of which, which could be, um, you know, I mean, men like page three, don't they? I mean, they, they could have been made by men to celebrate a, a, an early version of page three. Um, <laughs> uh, but I haven't found evidence of strongly... Uh, of, of strongly matriarchal. There are some matrilineal societies, matriarchal societies, but not as a, doesn't seem a general rule. Um, but never mind, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps that is the case, I, I don't know. So I, I my, myself, I follow a more, um, oopsie. Uh, my, I have some doubts about whether in fact the world of women and earth and nature is quite as benign as some of those early images say. Um, uh, I, women's experience in society and in looking after the needs of nature, I think, are, are, can be seen as pretty tough. And I'm not sure that women are necessarily happy in their work. So rather than seeing women as essentially connected with nature, I would much more see the relationship between women and nature as something they share a common experience undoubtedly they share a common experience but whether they've got that connection that the early ecofeminists thought I'm not sure I think it's much more I'm, I'm less romantic about women's life and of course the life of nature as well I think they're both treated very badly by our current economic system and that's what they have in common very 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 poor treatment uh, let me read you, um, uh, and uh, to say my, my doubts about early, early, earlier forms of human societies, whether they were more benign towards women. Um, I, did, I did a lot of anthropological research for my first book, Breaking the Boundaries. No, my second book. My first book about ecofeminism was called Breaking the Boundaries. And um, I read every bit of anthropology I could to see if there was a, 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 a more benign environment for women earlier. And we, it, the North American Indian, uh, not Native, Native Americans, were constantly um, being cited as being very, very you know, e um, egalitarian societies. Uh, so I found a 17th century um, traveler who actually um, went and visited the Canadian Huron people uh, in, the, uh, in the 17th century. And uh, he, he happened, very few people who traveled in early centuries, mainly men, ever talked about women, because they weren't interested in women. But this man did observe 
the, what was happening to the women. And he said, the Canadian Huron women, they till the soil, they sow the corn, they fetch the wood, they strip the hemp, they spin it, they make fishing nets, they harvest the corn, attend to the house, and follow their husbands from place to place where they serve as mules to carry the baggage. Now, I think that's more like what women's life was probably like. Um, I think, really, men often just messed about. And a lot of the work was done. Uh, all this image about hunting, the idea that men go off and hunt. Well, in the anthropology I've read, that they often ate what they caught before they got back again. And, um, and uh, men, uh, women, caught, um, got most of the, the animals they ate by trapping them, by digging pits and, and, uh, and nets or trapping them. So women's trapping... Uh, gave much more calories to their society than did men going off doing the big ritual hunt. Like I say, they often, they often um, ate it on the way back. So, so, so I, don't, um, I see it, the, the situation much more about what women do in society, that is women's work. And I, I see the way women are connected to the natural world is because of the kind of work they do, women's work. That's the constant oil. What's women work, women's work? Well, I see women's work as, which isn't necessarily always done by women. Um, it can be done by, it can be done by men by choice, usually by choice. It can be done by low status men. It can be done by children. Um, it can be done by servants, slaves even in the past. And to a certain extent, there's still slavery and this, uh, particularly domestic slavery is still common in many parts of the world. So I, I see what, what I call women's work, which is what I see as connecting with nature, is that it's the body work. It's the work to do with our survival in nature. That is the caring, the, notion, the nurturing, the emotional support. That is what women's work is. It's to do with the life of the body. And it's embedded in, not, in, in nature because it's embedded in the local. It's embedded in the, in the home, in, in, in the environment. Um, it's also the kind of routine and repetitive work that needs to be done over and over again. The fetching, the carrying, the weeding, the cooking, the cleaning. It's something where the cycle endlessly goes on. Uh, it's not sitting back and doing a job and, and saying, that's finished, doesn't it look good? Um, you know, the place is clean, doesn't it look good? And five minutes later, it's messed up again. Um, women's work is about being available and dependable, of being there, just being available, watching, waiting. And the other thing about women's work is very important is it's mainly unpaid or underpaid. Now, there's a lot of talk about uh, the love economy. Now, the love economy is seen as being what this domestic work is. It's the caring, it's the nurturing. Um, right from the start, I preferred to think of it more as imposed altruism. That is, it's altruistic because usually it's unpaid. So you're doing it for nothing. You're doing it for people. But I think it's also imposed. I don't think women have much choice about doing this work. Because although many women may choose this work through love, compassion, a lot more women do it, I would argue, out of duty, out of necessity, and also, in many cases, under conditions of fear and violence. So I don't think that domestic work is touchy-feely. I, I think it's a privilege if it is um, a loving, caring environment. I think, uh, you know, wonderful if it is, but I think for many women, they don't experience it that way. And as I've said, not all, not all women do women's work anyway. In fact, as, as women get more prosperous, they try, the first thing they do is try to find somebody else to do the work for them. I mean, I've got great sympathy with that. I hate domestic work as well. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, um, so freedom for women is about freeing themselves from domestic work. Now, under, a lot of ecofeminists would want to re-embrace that work under different conditions re-embrace it out of choice. So convert what can be in post-altruism into a love economy. Um, that may be the case. But I want to take this a bit deeper. I want to take this deeper into what I call ecofeminist political economy. And now I'm coming on to economy, trying to embed what I'm saying in economy. 
I think the link between women and nature is a very real one. It's not a one of identity. It's not women's essential nature being linked to, to nature's essential nature. I think it's much more uh, what I call materialist, uh, a materialist relationship, what I call materialist embodied ecofeminism. That is the relationship between women and nature is no accident and it's not anything to do with women being nice people, etc. Although I'm sure women are very nice people, but, uh, but that's not what it's all about. And, and so my take is this, is this final sentence here, and this is what I'll be talking about for the rest of the time. I think modern economies can only exist because of the exploitation of women's work and nature's resilience. So the modern economy is built on a completely false premise, and that is my ecofeminist position, that women and nature are linked because they both sustain what is in fact an unsustainable economy. And that's the connection. So there is a link between women and nature, but it's a much harder link than the, uh, than the, the kind of more romantic notions of the early, early ecofeminists. So let's pursue this point a bit more. There is a link between gender and sustainability. I'm calling it gender now uh, because that's a more um, a less essentialist concept. It's not to do with your essential nature as female or male, it's to do with your gendered position in society. And I would argue that patriarchal societies have exploited and subordinated women throughout history. And my evidence on reading the anthropological literature is that women had a hard time of it in most societies. Modern economies are unsustainable because we know they exploit and damage the natural environment. And as I've said, the gendered, it's the gendered nations, of, the gendered nature of modern economies that make them materially related to their unsustainability. So it's the, it, it is a thing, it, it is to do with, with, with gender, it is to do with the sexual division of labor that causes this unsustainability. So what we have then is a gendered economy. What we have is a society based on economic man, on market value, on personal wealth, on able-bodied workers, on people's labor and their intellect, on exploitable resources, and on knowledge that can be sold, intellectual property rights, knowledge that can be sold. That is the basis of our modern economy. On the other side of it is women's work, which, as I say, it can be done by men. I'm not, I'm not saying all women do women's work, and like I say, a lot of women get out of it if they possibly can. P uh, economies based on subsistence, or oh, I've called it provisioning, that is provisioning not based on profit, but on, based on, the, on the, um, uh, the goods and services that people need but not on a, on a for-profit basis. Social reciprocity, the sick, the needy, the old, the young, the life of the body, the fact that we have a 20... Our bodies exist for 24 hours, not the eight hours we're in work, and our bodies exist from birth till death, not just the, not just the years in which we are actively employed. But the, the system doesn't want to know about that. You're just a burden. If you're unhappy, you're old, you're sick, you're needy, you're just a burden. To the, to, to, to the modern economy. Ecosystems and wild nature and feelings, emotions and wisdom. So these things are the world, I would argue, of economic man. And this is the world that ecofeminism is focusing on. It's all the, it's all the, uh, the uh, almost embarrassing bits of the economy, the bits it doesn't want to think about. So, just to, 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 to reinforce this, modern economies have a hierarchy of value then, from high-paid, prestigious activities and occupations to low-paid and unpaid work. And um, perhaps I should go back to that one. Um, I'll leave that one up while I say this. Um, have a, so there's a hierarchy of value. This side is valued, this side is highly paid, this side is rewarded, all this side is underpaid, unrewarded, unacknowledged. 
and uh, women in nature therefore are connected by the way women's work and everything on this side of the, uh, of the screen is exploited or just in ignored by the other side of the screen. It doesn't want to know. Um, and the, the phrase that's used in, in economics about this is externalisation. In the costing of the world of economic man, they don't, want, it doesn't, they don't want to pay for ecosystem support. They don't want to pay for the sick, the needy, the old, the young. They don't want to pay for women's work. They don't want to pay for our social lives together. So that phrase used is externalised, off the accounts. They don't take account of it. It's not in the costings. So, so this side, the, the far side of, 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 of the screen, um, it, 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 its accounts and its uh, profit and loss accounts are all set up without taking account of any of these, uh, of any of these things because they don't want to know. It, it, it would affect profitability for a start. So who, who lives then on this side of the screen? Economic man does. And now economic man, rushing around with the briefcase or conquering the world, of course, can also be a woman. So that's why I'm talking about gender, not talking about men and women, because in order to live this world of economic man, a woman has to behave like economic man. You can't take your woman life into that world. You've got to go into that world on its own terms. So what's, what's economic man then? Who, as I say, remind, may be female, is quite the opposite to the, um, uh, the, 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 woman, the, the world of women's work. Economic man is disembodied. Disembodied from what I call eco, um, biological time. The time it takes to grow up, to grow old, to grow young, uh, to grow, don't grow young, do you? To grow, to bring up the young. The time it takes to sleep, to, uh, to eat, to in, ha have uh, uh, time to talk to your family, your friends. Um, economic man doesn't have any connection with that. He's he, he, I'll say he, but I, as you know, I, I, I do mean it can be she as well. This is, um, is, is, ignores the daily cycle of the body and the needs of the body and ignores the life cycle. It just lives in the hours of work and the, and, and the years of work. That is the only way economic man lives. And economic man is disembodied from ecological time as well. The seasons don't matter. You can have the same foods all the year round. Um, there's no concern about the needs of nature to replenish, to regenerate. Um, it's a world where there's no time for recycling. It's just a case of depletion and destruction, just using up the resources as fast as possible uh, to, get the, to, get the, uh, to, 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 to meet the bottom line, to get the profit you possibly can. So, that's, 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 so that is the alternative world of economic man. Um, here's a nice model of it. Um, which uh, was drawn up by um, Veronica Benholt Thompson and Maria Meese a long time ago, and this has been redrawn by Molly Scott Cato, some of you may have heard of. Um, the idea that what we call the economy, which is basically about capital and wage labour, sits like an iceberg on everything else. Homework, uh, in the informal sector, subsistence work, housework, colonisation, uh, the exploitation of nature. I mean, so, so uh, all this sits under the, the tip. Economic man is just the tip of an iceberg. So the material basis of economic man is women's work, is communal and reciprocal systems, it's free or undervalued natural resources, it's the resilience of the natural environment. This is what that little tip of the iceberg sits upon, what it, what it expects to have. So, so what I'm, so what I'm um, uh, concluding, I mean, this is the conclusion of my talk, what I'm concluding about economic man is that inequalities such as gender encourage a false optimism that humans can transcend natural conditions because the dominant groups 
The people who drive the system don't live within the real world of the body and nature. They live in a false world, a falsely constructed world. And that is the heart of my ecofeminism. My ecofeminism is that the subordination of nature, the subordination of women as gender, means that the, the, the dominant group, which includes a lot of women as well, the dominant group can behave as if they are not body people who live in bodies, who live in lifetimes, who live in, 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 in whole days, and who live in the world of nature. So that is my, my take on ecofeminism. So what then would an ecofeminist future be like? What, what would I see as, 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 as different? Well, I would argue that an economic future has to be one that lives consciously within its, within its ecosystem, that lives within its ecological means, that understands and appreciates the fact that we are only human beings in nature, that we don't think about profit-oriented profit economy, but we think about provisioning. We think about the idea of meeting people's needs in as economically sustainable a way as possible based on the notion of sufficiency, that is, on everybody having enough. Now, if I, if I say what's enough, it's a hard thing to, to, to do. What is enough? But, it, but you, you can think of what it's not. You know when somebody hasn't got enough. You know when people haven't got enough. And you know when people have too much. So I think a world in which there's nobody who doesn't have enough and there's nobody who has too much then I think that would be the world of sufficiency. Um, and if you were talking about sufficiency, if people are having enough, that must mean socially just, because everybody should have enough. Nobody should have too much, and nobody should have too little. So it automatically means, it, 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 it means equality. Straight away, it means equality. I think an ecofeminist future would prioritise the life world of women's work. That is... All those things that were on this side of that long list should be the priority. Looking after the sick, the young, the old, the needy, they should be the priority, not left out as an embarrassment to economic man. They should be the priority for, uh, for, for, for human society. And to do that, to stop this, this, this breakdown between the world of work and the world of the body, I think we've got to integrate work and life. We've got to share necessary work. We've got to, we've got to live within our, our whole bodies. We've got to live in a holistic way. And that would, must involve things like socially just and ecologically sustainable trade. And it must... Um, and our, one of the things I've uh, been interested in is, is... I know you live in a town here, but uh, how we can make much more convivial and sustainable cities, because the majority of people now in the world now live in cities. So we have to confront the life of a city. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think it's much easier to do all the things you're doing in Totnes than it would be. I mean, they're trying it in Bristol. Good on them, but uh, they might be able to. But uh, uh, it's, it's a bigger job, a much, much bigger job. So what, about, so what about sustainable provisioning then? I think we need to provision complex societies, as I say, on the basis of sufficiency. And the way to do that, I think, is to, to, we have to make a distinction between needs and wants. The modern economy says, it, oh, it can't make a difference. How can you tell what people need, what people want? You can only go with what people want. And I think we can't, in a, in a sustainable com, uh, economy, we can't do that. We can't just go with what people want. I think we've got to think about what people need and have a debate about what is needed. And as I say, the notion of, of social justice. I came across a lovely idea in anthropology, uh, no, in, in development work, sorry. Um, the idea of putting the last first. Robert Chambers came up with this idea. He's, um, I think it's Sussex University. And he said, when people go out to try and help other communities, now there's a bit, that's a bit um, patronizing as, in, in any case, but assume pe people do do it out of goodness of their heart. He said, when development workers go out into poorer communities, they tend mainly to interact with the local leaders. And he said, and therefore, the priorities are the priorities of the more dominant groups. 
He said, when you go out to, to, to look about what you can do to support people who are in difficulty, don't look for the most articulate, don't look for the people who turn up to the meetings, don't look for the people who seem to be the leaders. Find the person who doesn't turn up, find the person who is the most needy. And if your improvements, whatever it is you're planning to do, if it meets their needs, then it's probably the right thing to do. So you've got to, to, that's what he means by putting the last first. Find the people who have the least and see what they need. And, the, and to be honest, the better off can take care of themselves, the more powerful can take care of themselves to a reasonable extent. So this, again, this is, how I, this is how I see it. We all live within the ecosystem. And, uh, but in the heart of human society is this thing which we could call the valued economy. That is basically the economy of the market and the public, which is all involved with, uh, with, with, with uh, pay, is paid work, effectively, paid work and investment. And then sitting round it, slightly overlapping with it, but not a lot, is women's work, some of it which is taken in and paid, but if it is, it's very low paid. Ecosystem damage, some of it's paid for, a lot of it's ignored and not paid for. And the whole area of the non-market economy, all the things we do for each other, all the informal things, all the things we, we make, we cook, we visit, all the things we do to support each other. That's, and some of it, again, tips into the in, into paid work, but most of it is done. So basically, the, these areas are all the unpaid, the externalised areas, and this is the, the paid valued economy, the one that has, that has market value. So how do we challenge this then? How do we break down this? How, how do we... Because this, this here is the world of economic man. How do, we, how do we challenge the world of economic man? Well, the first thing I would do is replace the notion of economy with provisioning, which I've done already. And provisioning covers both what is currently paid and unpaid. So you, 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 what do people need uh, in terms of uh, emotional support, what, in physical support? What do they need? And, and try to meet that, regardless of whether it's at the moment paid or unpaid. And the, the concept of provisioning then would... In fact, the concept of provisioning would cover the whole lot because we're provisioned by the environment, we're provisioned by all the non-market activities, all the social events that sustain us, and we're, and we're provisioned by all the unpaid body work. So, uh, so provisioning would break down that, those whole circles. Um, as I say, it would, uh, stress, it would stress needs before wants. Um, but also, I would want to challenge the boundary of the valued economy, which is the boundary of money. And that's why, from um, writing a lot on ecofeminism, I decided to go and look at money itself, because I wanted to ask some questions about money. Because money value is the dominant motive for economic man. What does it cost? How many things have you wanted to do, and you've put forward lovely proposals for really nice things to happen, and immediately you're told, but who's going to pay? It's always stopped you. Where's the money to come from? Straight away, all the good things you want to do, it's always put down to, well, if you haven't got the money, uh, then you can't do it. So I started to ask some questions. Um, what is money? Uh, where does it come from? Who owns and controls it? How is it issued and circulated? How does it come to value some aspects of human existence and nurture and not others? I started off asking those kind of questions. And it's very, very difficult questions to, to answer. It's very difficult to say where money does come from, but I'll, I'll give you some clues. Now, if you go to an economist, an economist will say, well, it all started because of barter. Societies were based on barter, and uh, people used to um, swap their goods with each other, but this was awkward because you might have bananas, but you didn't want an apple, and, uh, and you really wanted an orange, uh, but, you, but uh, nobody wanted your bananas um, uh, except the person who wants an apple, who has an apple to give you, so awkward. So some bright spark invented coinage, which allowed us to have much more efficient market systems. And that's the story. 
Um, now, this is absolute nonsense. Um, there's no history of barter societies, and money itself is not, was never associated with trade, coinage. It was um, associated with rulers and usually associated with war, paying soldiers, paying mercenaries. So through most of history, coinage was invented around 600 BC and uh, it was used almost entirely by leaders to, 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 to use mercenaries to fight wars. So it's nothing to do with trade, nothing to do with apples and bananas. It was all to do with war. I mean, uh, not, uh, rather in a way it was apples and bananas than war, but that's what it was. Um, so it's not true that money emerged to replace barter and trade. And in fact, you can identify three origins of money in society. Yes, there is a route to, through trade, but that isn't generally coinage. That's generally other forms of, of money systems, which um, uh, are, are certainly not, not originally coinage. Um, the, there's, a, there's a public origin of money, which is these rulers who produce this coinage to fight wars. And there's a social origin of money. Most human societies have had, have had a money system. So, so this, for instance, is money. Um, it's the Yap people of uh, Micronesia. And this is what they have for money. And they, and they can manage with this perfectly well, completely unwieldy. You, they have got holes in the middle so you can roll them, but nobody owns one of those as such. Um, people negotiate based on uh, part, owning part of it, so they exchange parts of it with each other. And as you can see, money doesn't change hands, but what it does is it allows you to measure. So if you, for instance, have a, a, have a, a, a dowry, for instance, you're, 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 there's a marriage coming up and you want a dowry, and somebody wants to say, well, how, how much should the dowry be? You'd say, well, it should be so much of that stone. Well, obviously, you can't give somebody so much of that stone, but then you negotiate what is equivalent to so, so much of that stone. So you say, well, uh, so many bags of grain, so many, a few tools, um, a couple of goats, and a blanket. You know, you may decide that. So, so you, 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 you negotiate according to... Now, an, a, 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 more, a more prosperous family may um, decide a bigger slither is worthwhile. So that, that's something like... Um, cattle or something, something more, 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 uh, more expensive, as it were. So the point, so the point of these stones isn't that people own them, like you've got money in the bank, money in the bank. It's not that. It's a means of calculating relative values. I've had a fight with you and I've hurt you. I've broken your arm. Therefore, I, uh, a broken arm means you've got to pay me so much of a stone in re recompense. I had a fight and killed your brother. I've now got to give you equivalent to a quarter of a stone because I've killed your brother. That's my recompense because it's much, much worse to have killed your brother than have broken your arm. And this is really what money was used for. It was for enabling people to, to, to compare values. And that's how they were used. So that's social money. It's a social means of calculating relative values. And of course, there's modern uh, examples of social money like the Bristol Pound, um, where people uh, don't use big stones. They actually have money they can circulate. But uh, this represents, obviously, different values and uh, different activities for different values. So money isn't really about the graspingness of money, which is how we think of money. Well, money is about having a mechanism of comparing value and deciding how much something is worth. Uh, which is a useful thing to have. So that's the social uh, use of money. But there is also a public use of money. Um, money wasn't, uh, like I say, coinage was never invented by traders. Um, uh, coinage was invented by rulers, or, or at least colonised by rulers, used by rulers. All, um, all note money, all, um, all uh, banknotes are issued by central banks not by private banks. Uh, recently, with the crisis, we've had quantitative easing, which is money created by, by the state. 
Um, so right through history, we've had a lot of public money. Not recently, because the ideology of recent uh, uh, money is that uh, the state should not produce or be involved in money. All money in, modern, in our contemporary system is seen as being commercial, um, which I'll come on to. So there is a history. Uh, my, uh, notes and coin have virtually disappeared from our economy. If you, you, I bet you've hardly seen a young person uh, get, uh, get a five pound out of their pocket. It's always the card, isn't it? Mm. Even for small amounts, three, four, five pounds, one pound fifty, out comes the card. Um, so we've ha we hardly now use notes and coin, um, but, but we do have this huge amount of quantitative easing that has been used to rescue uh, the failed commercial system. So what we've lived under recently, and is the heart of economic man in recent years, is commercial money. And what commercial money is, is all the money you get by borrowing money from the banks. This isn't, uh, the, 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 the myth is that this is, um, this is the, uh, people's deposits that's being lent out, but that isn't true. Um, the, when the bank lends you money, it's lending you fresh money, it's lending you new money. It's just adding to the money supply. But it can't do it through giving you coins because it's, they're not allowed to mint coins. They can't do it through giving you banknotes because they're not allowed to produce banknotes. They can buy them off the central bank, but they can't produce them themselves. But what they can do is put money in your bank account or open a bank account you can draw on. So if you want to buy a house, you will have an account opened that allows you to draw so many N, the hundreds of thousands of pounds these days and to pay to the seller of the house. Now, the, there's a big problem with that kind of money. It beca it, it's only issued as debt, and it's always, which means that if it's issued as debt, we've always got to be, have it repaid. So banks issue money when people borrow, and they, um, they use it for whatever they're going to use it for. Then they've got to pay it back to the bank but they've got to pay more back to the bank than they receive because they've got to pay interest as well. So this is a very unstable system because it's always, the banks always want back more, more money than they've ever lent out. So this is very unstable. And so the, the, there's a couple of problems with this. First of all, there's a growth dynamic. The economy's got to continually expand, which is unsustainable anyway. It's unsustainable ec socially, it's unsustainable ec ecologically, and it's unsustainable economically. So a system based just purely on commercial money, on borrowing money from the banks uh, to, to fund your economy, just can't work. And as we've, we've just been through a major crash when the system collapsed, the system imploded. And what happened then when the system imploded is that we reverted to a huge amount of public money being issued. The only trouble is um, we are being um, kidded into thinking that this money is being borrowed from the commercial sector. So what can we do then to reclaim this economy? What's been happening, particularly in, in um, a country like Britain, is we have, we have totally collapsed our money supply system into our credit supply system. We've collapsed them into the only source of new money is the banking sector. And even when the government is producing new money now, quantitative easing, it's giving it to the banking sector to lend to us. And nobody wants to, well, we're being kidded back into borrowing it again in the housing market. But, uh, but it's still got to come out as debt. It's impossible for us as the people to get quantitative easing for ourselves. That is debt-free money. And um, I saw some figures which I'll share with you that the average household owes £54,000 in this country, which includes mortgages, which actually, for many people, doesn't sound a lot, but of course, that's averaged out across the pensioners and everybody who, who've paid their mortgages off. So the average is £54,000. Um, if the, all the £375 billion that went to quantitative easing to the banks had been shared out amongst us all, everybody, man, woman and child, could have had £6,000. So a household of four people, man, you know, uh, parents, two children, could, uh, could have got £24,000, which would have wiped out quite a lot of their debts. Well, a good portion of the debts anyway. And of course, if they didn't have any debts, then they, this money they could spend in the economy. 
And the obvious way to, and that was the obvious the way to, if you wanted to bounce the economy back, I mean, we may not want to bounce the economy back, but if we did, it's much better bouncing the economy back by giving everybody a certain amount of money, which is what they did in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, they gave every adult 6,000 Hong Kong dollars during the crisis, to, to back the crisis. In, in Australia, they gave everybody $1,500, Australian dollars, and, and therefore managed to not end up with this dreadful position of austerity. Give the money to the people, use public money, use money socially. Um, but our ideology is you can't do that. You can't, um, we, we don't even acknowledge now that there's such a thing as public money, even though billions and billions and billions of it has been created. But the good thing about public money is that you don't have to give it back. Because it's not issued as debt, if public, when public money is issued, it can be given away. It could, you could all have a basic income. Like I say, you could all have £6,000 just for the quantity of easing. You could give people a basic income. And then they could, then they could tr start trading among themselves in the same way as you issue your own local money. It can be done. And the nice thing about it is that it, it, you don't have to take back more than you've given out. But you do have to take some back because you have to stop too much money coming into the economy so what you have is a system of public expenditure or public allocation, like a, a basic income, and then a taxation system that reclaims a portion of that to stop it being inflationary. So you try and make sure that the amount of money you issue, free of debt, paying for the health service, paying for uh, investments of different sorts, um, you, you spend that out and then you tax back as much as you need to stop the amount of money you're putting out overwhelming the, the rest of the economy, basically the private sector and, and the retail sector. So that would be the perfectly uh, possible way to do, to have public money. And my ideal is the babysitting circle. Now, I use this today, but all the, all the, most, hardly any of the students have got babies, so they wouldn't know what a baby, <laughs> babysitting circle is. But anybody who's older and has had children has probably been in a babysitting circle, I don't know. But the whole point about a babysitting circle is it shows how important debt-free money is because, and how much you need money in any kind of trade system or any kind of goods and services system. Uh, because if you try to run a babysitting circle without tokens, it gets quite complicated as you're trying to remember who did what to whom. But the, the standard way to run a babysitting circle is for somebody to cut up a bit of card, create little one-hour tokens, and distribute it to all the parents. And then they start trading. And nobody t hoards them, nobody wants interest out of them, nobody wants them repaid, because the whole point of them is just to enable people to meet their needs, which is they need babysitters. And it's a perfectly simple, elegant, debt-free money system. And what we should do is, if we want an eco-feminist future, I think we should draw on what is very much a woman's work type activity. That is something to do with the family and babysitting. And it's a perfectly sensible economic system that parents have thought up for themselves. Standard, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know whether, how many people have done a token system? Yeah, at least, yeah, several people. It's very simple. And there's no reason why the rest of the economy shouldn't work like that. So basically then, um, What I would like to see is quantitative easing and debt-free money for the people, not the banking sector. I'd like to see us issuing and spending um, our money to meet needs and to save uh, the need to have food banks and donations. I mean, we might want to do that on top, but we shouldn't be doing that for basic needs. We should be doing that as extras. But to save the environment, the health service, education, I think, therefore, what we should argue for is public debt-free money for the people, as I say, and a, a people's money for sufficiency, which is based on ecofeminist principles of integrating the world of women's work and, and undermining the, 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 the world of economic man. And therefore, we should base our allocation of money on democratic priorities, we should have needs-led needs, needs expenditure. 
uh, we could uh, spend on public infrastructure here. We could spend on community and specialist banks, not-for-profit services and production, basic income, which I've already talked. And I think we could allocate an income to nature. I think nature should be allocated its own income to, so that it can be um, valued for itself and not valued to make, not cut down and destroyed to make money, uh, but that it should be able to um, uh, have an income so that it can be looked after uh, by, by, by the rest of us and take care of it. So we should make money serve us rather than us serve money. And that way we can integrate the world of ecofeminism, the world of nature and the world of women's work and integrate that into a wider provisioning system. And there's some references there. Um, uh, the, the, book, the, the book, The Future of Money, previous book on the politics of money, a book on feminism and ecology, and there's a load of lectures and talks on, on YouTube. If you just Google my name, it, there's quite a number of talks. Okay.